to your kids about the relationships, the friendships that they have. No harsher word that you could use in a word like that, or a statement or a phrase like that. And then the reality is, how do you respond to something like that? My point that I'm driving at is, what is your line in the sand? What are the principles that you've established? What is the understanding that you have as it relates to God's word to give you that protective measure and not going past that line in the sand? There was a time that we talked to kids about what they do when they go on a date. True or false? Okay, somehow they get shuffled off in the back because kids are going to do what kids are going to do. There's a consequence, isn't there? Is there a consequence if I choose the wrong friend? So at what point does that line of sand get drawn and what's the base of that line? Because your mom and dad says so. If all we're relying upon is what my mom and dad says so is the authority of my life for missing the boat. At what point does God come into play? At what point does the word of God come into play as it relates to the principles that we apply to our lives? So, Prophet says, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord because of this, because of what you have done, because of your helping the wicked, because of your love for those that hate the Lord, because of this, the wrath of the Lord is on you. Now, I think the statement that we find here is something that you and I can immediately dispute based on what Scripture says. And I'm going to point that out here in a few moments, so I want you to see some of that transition. So how do I define the line between help and cooperation? It's easy to look at our kids and tell them, okay, I don't want you to hand, hold hands with them. I don't want you to kiss. I don't want you to do these particular things. That's pretty cold, isn't it? Pretty point blank. So what is help and cooperation? When God says you helped and loved, the term love that's related there is there's a real agape, there's a real desire that Jehoshaphat has towards Ahab. Why? Because his son is married to Ahab's daughter. My daughters are married to other guys. I have learned to love these other guys. They are now a part of my family. Are there things that they do that I think, what a bonehead move? <laughs> yes. As a result, what do I do? When I see them, I say, dude, what the world were you thinking? Now, we haven't had a lot of conversation like that, but you get the idea. There's a love, there's a connection, and what the prophet is saying to Jehoshaphat is, Jehoshaphat, you have made a commitment to the wicked, you have loved the wicked, and you have no clue the consequence that you're going to bear as a result of your commitment to that. So we get to that point where we say, well, how exactly do I define that line between help and cooperation? So in turn, I almost have to ask you this question. How much control does the Holy Spirit have over your life? Because when the Holy Spirit does not have control, guess what? Some of those lines, some of those definitions that you provide to help in cooperation are going to bear a mixture of your perspective, of what you've been raised with, what you've heard, but it's not always going to have the full truth of God's word in it. First of all, some of the problems when we talk about making that line and understanding what that line is. I think you need to ask yourself this question. Am I in the way? Am I in the way? Best way I can think about this, am I in the way concept. You understand that I do not like to do plumbing. Plumbing is a hard thing to do. This is the greatest example of am I in the way. When you're having to fix a kitchen sink and go underneath the vanity, how many bodies do you think can fit underneath the vanity and work underneath the kitchen sink? One. One. Barely can squeeze that one set of arms in there, and then Blaine says, here, let me give you a hand. I got long arms. Yeah, you do, but I'm still sitting there, and then suddenly now that centerpiece of wood is busted because I'm too fat. It wasn't Blaine because he's lost a lot of weight. But you get the idea. Am I in the way? Book of 1 Kings chapter 21, we talked about this before. God's doing something in Israel, isn't he? God's working with the life of Ahab. Mount Carmel, God's trying to get a hold of the attention of the nation of Israel. Are they listening? Is it changing anything? We don't know, we can't see it, but God's work, this is hard for you and I to understand, I really believe this, God's work can be a dangerous, dangerous place. As I watch my kids, both as children and as adults, it's easy to forge a relationship with somebody who 
one doesn't know the Lord and is walking down that wrong path, what is that wrong path? Fill in the blanks with whatever it is that you want. Sooner or later, if God, if we pray that God reaches our nation, we speak in general terms, don't we? If we pray that God reaches our community, if we pray that God reaches our high school, if we pray that God reaches all these things that are important to us, we've asked God to begin a working process that we are not always guaranteed that God may use some tools and methods that are really unpalatable or undesirous for us to be in the middle of. You get that? It's hard to swallow, hard to think through. Have I defined cooperation and love? What exactly does it mean to cooperate and love people? What does that mean? I, I actually took some time and I wrote down what the word cooperate and love meant from a biblical standpoint. Here's what we come up with as we look at this. So as Jehoshaphat is helping, Jehoshaphat is putting a surrounding hedge of protection around Ahab because why? He's bringing out his soldiers to help, isn't he? He is protecting Ahab. He is aiding Ahab. He's succoring Ahab, not like a sucker punch, but he's encouraging this man. Even though he's sinful and he's having a strong desire, Jehoshaphat is trying to help him exist, even though God has something else in mind. As you read the story of 1 Kings, I think it's either 1 Kings or 2 Chronicles, one of the things that we find related is the prophet of God stands before Jehoshaphat and Ahab, Ahab and says, don't go to battle, but I want you to know this, that there's been a conversation in heaven between God and the angels, and there's an angel that stood up and said, let me go down and I can lie and trick them. Read it in the Bible. It's easier for you to read than it is for me to explain it to you. But the point is, God's work with Ahab, because Ahab has reached the end of his life, hasn't he? God has been giving him time after time after time after time to repent, to turn the right direction, but Ahab has refused, and guess who shows up to help Ahab at this point in his life? Jehoshaphat. Is Jehoshaphat running the risk of being in the way? You bet. How do I define cooperation? Book of Matthew chapter 5, verse number 43 through 48. I think it really gives us a different perspective on this. Let me show you what that says. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Remember, what did Christ say about his ministry? I am come not to dispel or destroy the law, but I am come to do what? Fulfill the law. So I think these verses here, in comparison to what we've seen said to Jehoshaphat, says that Jehoshaphat understood that Ahab was not for the Lord, but was against God. And despite Ahab's firm stand, obvious stand, his testimony, all the words that came out of his mouth, Jehoshaphat determined that love was a far better thing, even though the evidence was there. So notice what the Lord says, but I tell you, love your enemies. So God's telling me to love my enemies, isn't he? God's telling me to pray for those who persecute me that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise with evil and the good. Even God gives rain, gives blessing to those who are deserving. But nonetheless, I have to remember what? That God is working in the lives of people. I'm not the one who does that work. My middle name is not Holy Spirit. My middle name is Jonathan, not Holy Spirit. And too many times, I remember this as a young man in college, Remember these girls coming to Bible college thinking that you know they could they could uh, get their education and then they then they can go out there and marry whoever they want because they can now change the world for Jesus Christ. You're not going to change the heart of an individual. The only one who does that is the Holy Spirit of God. In the Old Testament, the word of God shall not return void, but will accomplish that soever it purposeth. The principle that behind that is. God's word doesn't change. The Holy Spirit doesn't change. All I can do is open it to the page and hope that the Holy Spirit does with what it is I've revealed. So scripture goes on, that you may be the children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise in the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? I can see Je uh, Jehoshaphat's name right here. Jehoshaphat, if you're loving those who love you for what it is you give them, Let's be quite blunt here. If you love someone simply because of sex you're getting out of the deal, what kind of a situation you got going on there? If you love someone simply because of the money that they're giving, what are, you, what are you getting out of it? And you can go on and on and fill those blanks, can you not? 
But the reality is, God comes across loud and clear says, if you love those who love you, what reward we get are not any of the tax collectors doing that. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And I go back to in my mind where the Apostle Paul says, you know, physical exercise is a good thing, but godliness is good to all things. Ultimately, I have to begin asking myself a question that when the evidence, when the truth, when the spiritual fruit is not there, what is it that I'm hoping to lend to this equation? Because from me is not coming the water of life. Uh, David even says in the book of Psalm chapter 1, I'm supposed to be sinking my roots down to the water. I cannot sink someone else's roots over here. The word of God has to be something that they're drawn to. And who does that? The Holy Spirit of God. Do I have spiritual sensitivity to sense, avoid danger? There's a specific term that I like in relation to Spider-Man. That is, Spider-Man had spidey sense, didn't he? <laughs> that intuitive sense, as I'm watching the first, first movie, the big bully guy is going to punch, and he sees a punch. And he's missing, and the guy's just hitting exactly right quick, just like that. Do I have a spiritual sensitivity to sense and avoid danger. We've asked this many times in church before, have you driven from A to B and along the way you really get a strong sense that maybe there's a different path to take? And you've said many times, yep, I agree, I've been there too. So why is it that I can get that sensitivity of danger, but I cannot get sensitivity as it applies to my relationships and the connections I have with other people. Is it something I've become immune to? Passage after passage relates to that. I want to highlight one specific as it relates to the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse number 20 and 21. The Apostle Paul simply said this. He says, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I'm not giving up my assets. I'm not giving up my blessings. I'm not giving my the pearls of, that I'm tossing out with pigs. I'm not giving those up. I'm retaining that and anticipating that God, through his goodness, and the Holy Spirit is going to direct me and guide me at just the right time and just the right place so I can be a blessing to others. But I need to have that sensitivity to recognize that there's a time where I also must withdraw. I really believe this, that our kids have a heart... I'll say this to you point blank. My kids, my children, my three kids have a great difficulty with having friendships. You know why? Because their mom and dad have difficulties with friendships. One of the greatest pieces of poison fruit that I've ever been given in my entire life as relates to ministry was simply this. As a pastor in ministry, you cannot afford to have friends. As a result of that, guess what I did through my entire life? Friendships stayed at arm's length. Guess what happens to my kids? They never have friendships other than their arm's length. Why? Because they saw a pattern. My point is this. As parents teaching our kids, parents living out the same principles, do I put into practice not my preferential understanding and growth pattern, but do I put into practice the principles of God's word that give life? Has my judgment become clouded? Has my judgment become clouded? You notice I'm not giving you specific answers how to answer this question. Who's going to do that in your life? The Holy Spirit of God. Has my judgment become cloud? Matthew, Proverbs chapter 26, 11, Matthew 7, 6, 1 Corinthians 2, 15, 16, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 22, all deal with this particular concept. 1 Corinthians 2, 16 says this, For who has known the mind of the Lord? Whose responsibility is it to know the mind of God? Mine. How do I know the mind of God? Through what? 
Like we talked about earlier, the Holy Spirit of God, as I invest that time in knowing the Holy Spirit of God, what does he do? He makes me aware of his riches. He gives me that wealth of understanding. He gives me a base of how to act. So as I know the mind of the Lord, I am instructed. Praise God that I have the mind of Christ. There is some real depth in that. And here's the thing that I fear for us as individuals in this day and age. We lack a distinct decision-making ability because we are not concerned about seeking the mind of the Lord in things. We're more so concerned about simply following the patterns of what we've seen going on before. And then we find ourselves on the wrong side of the line and wonder, wow, what in the world did I ever do to get on this side of things? And it all starts because, in one particular case, we've allowed our judgment to get cloudy. You can't help but think about Jehoshaphat. Why in the world would that man ever make an alliance with Ahab? You remember up to this particular point with Jehoshaphat, all the previous kings had been fighting with Jeroboam to try to unite the land. Jehoshaphat probably in his thinking thought, you know, this is not a good strategic ideal for our nation. It's having economic repercussions. We just need to make peace. And so we'll do that. Remember what the Lord said to uh, Rehoboam way back. We talked about this. God said to Rehoboam, Rehoboam, I'm paraphrasing, don't mess with Israel. Leave them alone. Did God ever come back and say anything different? We find no record of that whatsoever. So what does Jehoshaphat do? Let's go in the opposite direction. Let's look at another question as it relates to your line of sand. Ask yourself this, how is my impact defined? We always think that we're gonna go changing someone else, don't we? How is my impact defined? Psalm chapter 1, 6, Romans 1, 18 through 32. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 1 through 4, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3. You find there passage after passage after passage. Psalms 1 6 deals with the consequence. What happens? The way of the ungodly shall perish. Do you have a timeline of when the ungodly is going to perish? No. I don't have that time. I was looking at some of this. One of the things that fascinates me, and I mentioned this to you before, I will go to YouTube and I'll watch them on YouTube just for fun because I enjoy that kind of thing. And so I've been watching for the last several months Mount Everest. Love Mount Everest. And there was a video that I watched this morning about climbers going up Mount Everest, 29,000, 29 feet, and it's like a very difficult mountain to climb. And there is a particular section just outside of base camp at Mount Everest where they climb and they have to start very early in the morning. Because of that reason, I can never climb. Because of that reason, I'm just barely able to function as a hunter. So it's very early in the morning, that's, that's the problem. But very early in the morning, they have to get out and they have to begin hiking a 2,500 foot incline up through an area which is called the crevasse. And the crevasse is a snow <coughs> ice field that is coming down the mountain. It's completely broken up in many different places and you have to climb across this by using metal ladders. And the reason they do it during the nighttime is it is cold. Ice is cold. And so there's this big ice flow coming down the mountain that they're crossing. During the daytime, guess what happens to the ice? It begins to heat up, it begins to melt, it begins to move. More people are killed on Mount Everest going through the ice flow during the daytime than they are at nighttime. Why? Because of the increased level of risk. When David says in Psalm chapter 1, verse number 6, that the way of the ungodly shall perish, do I have a guarantee of when that perishing is coming? The termination? No. But the Lord says to David, David, here's what I want you to know. The way of the ungodly is going to produce this result. You better make sure that you're out of that way. You don't have a guarantee when something's going to happen that's going to bring your life to it. How many times do you see characters in the scriptures who are living a good life and then they're called short? You and I see that in the day and age in which we live all the time, don't we? It's a harsh thing to consider, but the reality is there. Romans chapter 1, verse number 18 through 32, Paul writes there to the Roman believers, he's basically saying, the unsaved are pursuing a path 
that satisfies their lust, but the reality is their lust is going to produce death, separation from God. Confrontation, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 6, there's a difference between the believer and the non-believer. As far as the non-believer is concerned, we know that God's word says death is coming, but we don't have that guarantee of when that time frame is. When we come to the believer, we understand that there's difficulties that we deal with from time to time as it deals with people. What's the responsibility that I have as a believer? God gives me a uniquely different charge, which is confrontation, discussion, conversation. Which is more enjoyable, death or confrontation? Neither. <laughs> you don't have a choice, do you? You never know when death is going to call, but boy, confrontation, I want to avoid that as much as I can. Paul says in the book of Galatians chapter 6, as believers, if you've got a problem with your brother, you need to go to them and you need to talk with them. Talk to them about the spiritual principles of God's word and its application. Neither is an easy relational step, but is a, it is an inevitable step that is going to happen in either case. This is what we find in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 14 through 15, as we close with this. Paul said this, but as for you, continue in what you've learned. Why do I continue? Because what is the Holy Spirit of God doing? He's teaching me. He's instructing me. Going through math class years ago, I hated math. I still hate math, but I do know one thing. That if I want to find out the square footage of the room that I need to put carpet down, guess what I need to know? Length times width equals area. There's a lot of other mathematical equations that serve valuable purpose. And so I understand that as I continue what I've learned, I begin adding more and more. Why? Because the Holy Spirit of God is working in my life. That's what Paul's saying here. But as for you, continue what you've learned and I've become convinced of. I'm convinced because I've seen God evidence himself time for time for time. God's faithful when I'm not faithful. I'm convinced of that because you know those from whom you've learned it. There's people I've learned things from in my lifetime who are no longer here. They've had an impact on my life. What responsibility do I have? Rex, you know I talked about something about this specifically last week. And it's one of those things that gets you emotional because you recognize as you get older, there's a point in time where it's like, thanks, I'll take, I'll take, I'll take. And then as you get older, you realize what the investment really was. And there's greater appreciation for that. And Paul's now saying, you've known who you've learned it from. You know the investment that was made. God works in an amazing way through the Holy Spirit of God and through who else? People. God uses you as iron sharpening iron for the sake of becoming a vital tool in the tool just that God has for us in this particular community. It goes on. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to do what? Make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That's some really powerful stuff there as you and I consider that. And I pray that those are some questions, some principles that help you to determine where exactly is that line in the sand? Because I think in all honesty, we oftentimes take lines in the sand that have been drawn by parents, by church people, by others, but we've never taken the time to determine why do I do it this particular way? I remember so many times my mom and dad saying, you know, do this because I'm your parent. That doesn't fly. It really does not fly. <laughs> yes, it deals with the issue of authority and who a parent is within the chain of authority, and I need to understand who God is within that chain of authority. But the ultimate factor is there is a principle that should guide the base of how we live godly in Christ Jesus. And if we cannot cite a principle, but we're simply referencing preferences, we're living in a world of hurts. And that will always reflect itself in that line, because why? We'll then find yourself being able to move that line, because it's simply not convenient like the choice that we made up to that particular point. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning, and Father, we thank you for the principles that we find in your word. It would be so easy to stand up and say, we should be careful of friends that do this, that, and the other thing. And God, a pattern like that would begin to express my point of view, my opinions, my personality, my perspective on things. 
Yet God, the same way that you work in each of us individually, you apply your word principally in an individual way in our lives. God, I pray that we would have taken the time this morning to allow your Holy Spirit to open our eyes to the principles of what your word teaches and that we would be just as brave and take the corrective steps to live godly in Christ Jesus through what we see the Holy Spirit showing us today. Father, I pray that your Spirit would minister to our hearts. Keep us restless as we fight with the Scriptures, as we fight with what we see in the Word of God, so that we might be thoroughly furnished unto all good works in Christ Jesus. We thank you for these things, Father, for your name we ask. Amen.